Namaskar. Today I'm going to be talking about the, um, the fourth and final verse of Aplapatu. Um, <clears throat> in the previous three verses, we saw how Bhagavan describes the, um, the, the various uh, um, stages of preparation of, a, um, of, a, <clears throat> of an apalam. And in this final verse, he explains how that aplam is then to be cooked and eaten. Um, and he also reveals what its nature is. Um, uh, because he's describing here the making of an aplam, he describes it as if there are there um, stages, as if he's going through a series of stages. But but in, spirit, in the spiritual path, there are not a series of stages exactly. Um, so he is describing, for example, in the first verse, he described the practice of um, the means by which the, he did, that, that is the first thing that is to be done to prepare an apalam is to, um, is to uh, break the um, powder, the um, um, the, the, the black gram uh, grains, uh, or reduce it to, uh, to to break them and to reduce them to uh, something close to a powder, and that is done in a hand mill. The hand mill, he says, is the practice of jnana vichara. Who am I? Then in the second verse, he describes some other associated, but um, the other associated ingredients. That, that is all the qualities that are required to, fo to follow this path. And then in the third verse, he talks about um, the, um, uh, uh, ceaselessly um, uh, <coughs> uh, pounding the ingredients. And there again, that, that is but his description of the pounding of the ingredient. It is actually another way. He says there he described the pounding of the ingredients by the, the pestle of looking within or facing within. Facing within and jnana vichara are actually the same thing. So it's, we should be, though Bhagavan has described different the stages of making an apalam, they are all actually referring, they're all metaphors for the same practice of turning within and investigating who am I. So we shouldn't think that, there are, that, that we have to go through a series of stages in this path. Essentially, the practice from the beginning to the end is turning our attention within and, um, and thereby sinking deeper and deeper into our heart. So there are no stages in this path. We, we start off by turning our attention, or be, beginning to turn our attention within. When we fully turn our attention within, that is when we turn the full 180 degrees, so to speak, when our attention is wholly focused on ourselves, so, so much so that we thereby cease to be aware of anything else at all, that is the conclusion. That, that is the, that it is at that moment that we will experience ourselves as pure awareness. And by experiencing ourselves as pure awareness, ego will be destroyed forever. Um, so in as I say, in this uh, in this fourth verse, he's talking about the um the final stages of the preparation of uh, the, the apalom. But again, he's he's essentially describing the same thing. Um I'll first um, read the verse and the meaning, and then I'll go through it step by step. What he says in the verse is, Mona mudreyahum mudivila patratil, nyanagnial kayum nal brahma nei adil, nan aduaha, nan aduvaha ahave, nalum poritu, Tane tanaha pujika tanmaya uh, aplamituparu. Uh, that is the, the, the sense of the, of the verse is completed by the, the palavi, which is aplamituparu. Um, <coughs> um, aplamituparu means making aplam see. Um, and the, the full, the full uh, palavi is um, making aplam see, eating it, putting it into your desire. 
So that completes the sense of a verse. So the meaning of this is to experience oneself as oneself alone is, sorry, to experience as oneself alone is oneself in that the excellent ghee of Brahman, which is heated by the fire of jnana in the infinite pan, which is Mona mudra, constantly frying as I am that, making apalam composed of that sea. Um, so I'll go through this um, uh, uh, line by line. In the, um, in, in the first three lines, he explains how it is to be cooked. That is, in what, what he says is, uh, in that the excellent gear of Brahman, which is heated by the fire of jnana, in the infinite pan, which is Mona Mudra, constantly frying as I am that. So this is the first three lines. In the first line, he, he starts by explaining where the apalam is to be cooked. Namely, uh, Mona Mudrayahum Mudivila Patritil, in the infinite pan, which is Mona Mudra. Mona Mudra um, means the, the uh, Mona means silence, Mudra is a, a sign. Uh, so Mona Mudra means the silent sign or the sign of silence in the sense of the silence that is si sorry, the sign that is silence. Um, and the reason why he describes uh, Mona as a mudra, uh, as, a, as a sign, is that mudras are a non-verbal means of communication. Usually mudras are, um, there are a number of um, hand signs that are uh, mudras. There's, uh, um, I, I don't know what all the mudras are. One of them, I think, is chin mudra, which is something like this with the, 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 the thumb and forefinger touching together and the other fingers pointing up, something like that. That is the chin mudra, the mudra of, of awareness. But um, here Bhagavan talks about mona mudra. So obviously he's not talking here about hand signs. What, the reason he calls mona a mudra is, that, as I say, mudras are a non-verbal -mean means of communication. And mona is the ultimate non-verbal means of communication because it alone can reveal the real nature of ourself. That is, when we investigate ourselves so keenly that we subside back within and dissolve forever in the source from which we have risen, what remains is just the infinite silence of pure being. And it is only in that infinite silence that our real nature will shine clearly, because our real nature is nothing other than that silence itself. That is, the very, the very rising of our, our self as ego is a noise. It's seemingly, of course, the silence itself is never disturbed. Silence always remains as it is. But in our view, the silence is disturbed by our rising as ego. And ego is the first rising, and it gives rise to all other risings, the rising of the body, the world, the endless events that are taking place in the world, all the, all the joys and sorrows of life, all the um, birth and death, and the whole of samsara is nothing but a constant, endless series of risings and subsidings. And all this rising and subsiding, the whole of samsara is noise. So in samsara, we cannot know our real nature because our real nature is pure silence. In order to experience ourselves as we actually are, we need to sink deep within ourselves. And only when we, when we, when I say we seek, sink deep within ourselves, that means ego needs to subside uh, within and dissolve back into its source. Its source being the pure awareness I am, which is itself the infinite silence. So it is our real nature is silence, and it is only in the silence of our real nature that our real nature can reveal itself. And to whom does it reveal itself? It reveals itself to itself alone. That is, we as ego will never know what we actually are, because ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourself, awareness of ourself as. I am this person, I am Michael or whoever. The, the, the Michael or whatever our name may be is the name of a body, a person, 
but we we say I am such and such a person because we mistake this body to be ourself. So long as we mistake this body to be ourself, we cannot know ourselves as we actually are. And it's only when we are aware of ourselves as a body, but we're consequently aware of so many other things. So so long as we rise as ego, we cannot know the pure silence, but we actually are. In order to experience that pure silence, we need to subside and lose ourselves in that silence. And then that silence will reveal itself to itself. This is the, um, but, well, the silence will reveal itself to us, but as, to us as ego. But as soon as ego experiences itself as silence, that is the silence of pure being, the silence of pure awareness, it will cease, we will cease to be ego and remain as that silence. So it's not, e ego can never actually experience that because as soon as ego experiences that, it ceases to be ego and remains at that because that alone can experience that. That being, I am. Though we refer to it in the third person, it's actually the first person. It is, that is when Brahman is often referred to as that. But what is that Brahman? Tattva Masi, you are that. So that means Brahman is that which is always shining in our heart as I. So what is referred to as that is only uh, that pure awareness I am, which is what we always actually are. That is silence. Um, so that is, it's only in the, in the, um, Bhagavan says, uh, uh, Mona Mudrayahum, Mudivila Patritil. Um, uh, that means in the, in the endless, uh, Patra means vessel. In the endless vessel, which is the, the, the Mona Mudra, the, the sign of silence, or we can take it as the, the language of silence. So that, that he, he, desc mud, he describes it as Mudivila. Mud, mudivu means end, limit, or death. Uh, so Mudivila uh, means, uh, without uh, Mudivu, means endless, limitless, deathless, eternal, indestructible, and infinite. That is what we actually are. And that is the nature, that is our real nature. And that is, because it is endless, limitless, deathless, eternal, indestructible, infinite, that means it is it, it, it's infinite, it has got no, no limit, and it's also immutable. Um, because anything that is changes, it's one thing at one time, and then becomes another thing at another time. So it is not eternal. What is eternal must also be immutable, unchanging. So that is our real nature. Um, and that is why, because of its immutability, it is silence. It, that is, all noise is 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 right appearance and disappearance rising and subsiding in the state which is in the infinite state of our our own being there is no rising and subsiding so it's a state of perfect silence um uh so what bhagavan describes as the uh as the, the place or state in which our apple is to be cooked um he, when he describes it as mona mudrayahum mudivila patritel, the infinite in the infinite pan, which is mona mudra, what he implies is that it is the infinite and eternal space of silence, because such silence alone is what will reveal to us what we always actually are, namely the pure awareness: I am just I. Then in the second line, he explains to us the medium in which uh, this, uh, patram, uh, uh, sorry, the medium in which the, the apple is to be cooked and the fire over which it is to be cooked. Uh, namely, Nyanagnyal Kayam Nal Brahma Neyadil. Nyanagni means the fire of Jnana. Nyanagnyal means by the fire of Jnana. Kayam means which is heated. Uh, nal Brahma Ne. Uh, nal, uh, nal literally means good. Uh, we can take it as excellent. Br Brahma Ne. Ne, ne is ghee, uh, clarified butter, pure clarified butter. So Brahma Ne is the uh, clarified 
uh, the excellent ghee, which is Brahman. Um, it, so in that excellent ghee, which is Brahman. So Brahman is the ghee in which the, um, in which the aplam is to be cooked, and it is to be heated by the fire of jnana. So that means in the excellent ghee of Brahman, which is heated by the fire of, of jnana. That is the excellent... Um, the excellent ghee or clarified butter in which it is to be cooked is Brahman, and the fire over which it is to be cooked is Jnana Agni, the fire of Jnana or pure awareness. However, since Mona, Jnana, and Brahman are all nothing other than ourselves as we actually are, what he implies here is not that there are three different things. First, we've got to have Mona, then we, go, we need the fire of Jnana, and we need Brahman. These are not three different things. They are one and the same thing. They are what we actually are. Our own real nature is all these three. Um, so they're all just different ways of describing our own real nature. Mona means silence. Jnana means pure awareness. Brahman means ourselves, what we actually are. So they, these are all referring to our own real nature. Um, so in the, what he implies in these two lines is that our uh, apalam is to be cooked in the infinite pan that is ourself, in the ghee that is ourself, heated by the fire that is ourself, because it is only by sinking deep within ourself and thereby just being ourself as we always actually are, namely as I am I, that we can know ourselves as we actually are. Um, so as, as I said earlier, though Bhagavan is describing many things here, these are all just different descriptions of the same simple practice of turning within and just remaining as we actually are, as pure being. Um, so this is further emphasized by him in the third line, in which he explains how our um, Aplam is to be cooked in that ghee of Brahman, which is our self, heated by the fire of Jnana, which is our self, in the infinite space of Mona, which is our self. That is what he says in the third line is, Nan adu ahave uh, nalum poritu. That means um, constantly frying as I am that. Here, th that adu refers to Brahman, which is ourself as we actually are, namely as the adjunctless, uh, namely as the, the, the pure awareness I, in its pristine condition, uncontaminated by even the slightest stain of any adjunct. So what he indirectly implies by saying that our apalam is to be constantly fried as I am that, is that we should experience ourselves eternally as I am I. And we can experience ourselves thus on, only in ourself as ourself, because nothing other than ourself actually exists. Um, in the previous verse, he described the, um, the, the, the practice as um, um, then, uh, sorry. Uh, Kal Nengel in the in the in the stone of the heart uh, that it, he's he's comparing the heart to the to the mortar uh, in which the, the, the ingredients have to be crushed. Um, nan nan indru kalangamul ulmuka ulankayal oyadu iditu. That that means by the pestle of facing inwards without being agitated, incessantly pounding as I am I in the heart stone. So here he's describing I am I, that is the, I am I means, is what he sometimes referred to as parana, that is that clarity of awareness. What is it? It's a, why does he call it I am I? Because it's awareness of ourself as ourself alone. Now we are aware of ourself as I am this body. But the more we look within, the more the body will drop down, the more the adjuncts will drop down, and the more clearly we will be aware of ourselves, not as I am this or I am that, but as I am I alone. I'm nothing other than I. So here he, he describes I am I as the, as the uh, practice. In this last verse, he's, he implies that it is the, um, 
well, actually, it's in the fourth line mostly, but he implies this. But even in this third line, just indirectly, he's implying that the goal it's, is also I am I. That is, I am I, as I said, it means experience of our self as our self alone. So when he says, um, uh, um, constantly praying as I am that, as I say, that refers to Brahman, which is our which is nothing but I, Aham Brahmasmi. Or as Bhagavan said in, um, in, in a verse he composed, Hridya um, Guhara Madhye, in the center of the uh, heart cave, Kevalam Brahma Matram, the, 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 um, the single uh, uh, solitary Brahman um, uh, alone, uh, Nan Nan Indru, Sorry, not na na into aham 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 iti. As I as I am I, uh, atma sakshat atma rupena bhati. That that Brahman shines uh, in the form of oneself as I am I. So I am I is the very nature of Brahman. That is the very nature of Brahman is to be always aware of itself as itself alone. So. Since that is our goal, to be aware of ourself as ourself alone, in other words, as I am I, the means is also to be aware of ourself as I am I alone. So how can we be aware of ourself as I am I alone? Only by attending to ourself alone. So the more we look within, the, the more we extricate ourselves from the adjuncts with which we have now mixed ourselves. And in the absence of ad adjuncts, who am I? I am nothing but I, but that is the I that remains when all adjuncts are removed. That is what I am. That's why Bhagavan often used this term, I am I. He also uses a term in the next, uh, the final, um, uh, final line of this verse, which means the same, Tane Tan. Tane Tan means oneself alone is oneself. And so obviously it means the same as I, I alone am I. And also in, um, in Arunachala Akshramla, in verse 43, he says, Tane, Tane, Tatpam. Uh, oneself alone is oneself. That alone is the reality. So, uh, what is the reality? What is Brahman? It is nothing but I am I. That it, is, it is that pure awareness I, but is aware of itself as nothing other than itself, as I alone am I. So this is the nature of Brahman. This is our real nature. This is what we actually are. So um, though in this third line, he, he uses the term nan-adu, we should understand adu, that is referring to Brahman, which is nothing other than I. So what does I am that mean? It means I am I. Um, so in so many different ways, Bhagavan is, is, um, is pointing out, he's is, is pointing us back towards ourself. He's also, by using these terms, why does he use the term nanadu here? Because he's, Bhagavan is constantly uh, pointing out the, the practical implication of all of Vedanta. And I am that is one of the central truths of Vedanta. I am Brahman or, or Tattvamasi, these Mahabhakas, they're revealing what we actually are. So what are we? I am that. But what does that refer to? It doesn't refer to any... When we start off on this path, we, we are looking for something outside ourselves. We're looking for God or for Brahman or for um, the truth or for knowledge, or for happiness, or something. We are taking these, because we seem to be lacking these things, we are looking for them outside ourselves. But the purpose of the Mahavakyas, uh, such as Tattvamasi, you are that, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am Atma Brahman, this very Atman, is, this very self is Brahman, and Pragnanam Brahman. This awareness is Brahman. So all these Mahavakyas are pointing out that what we have been seeking outside ourselves, that Brahman that we've been seeking outside ourselves, is actually nothing but ourselves. So they're all turning our attention back towards ourselves. So when it is said, I am that, what does I am that mean? That is referring to Brahman. And what is Brahman? Nothing but I. So uh, I am that is nothing means nothing other than I am I.
That's why Bhagavan often um, put so much emphasis on this uh, term, I, I am I. Unfortunately, it's, it's been lost in many of the English translations because in Tamil or Sanskrit, when you want to say, I am that, you, you don't have, the, the word am is understood. So, for example, in Tamil, what, what Bhagavan has said here is um, nan adu. That means I that. But the am is understood there. The am is implied there. So, likewise, when he says I am I, the am is not actually explicit there. It's implicit. So, uh, nan nan or aham aham mean, doesn't mean I hyphen I as it's usually translated. It means I am I. That is, what of, who am I? I am only I. I'm nothing other than myself. That's, what, uh, that's why he also expresses it as tane tanaha, oneself alone is oneself. So this is, our goal is to experience ourself as ourself alone. And the means to experience ourself as ourself alone is to experience ourself as ourself alone, which is why in the previous verse he talked about Pounding incessantly as I am I. Pounding incessantly as I am I means holding on to that sparana, that clarity of awareness, but I am nothing other than myself. I am, I, I am not this or that, I am only I. That is, the more we look with it, why Bhagavan used this term sparana? Sparana simply means, in this context, in, I mean, the word sparana can have different meanings in different contexts, but the sense in which Bhagavan used it, sparana means clarity, means shining clearly. So, so long as we are looking outwards, we are experiencing ourselves as I am this body. The more we look within, we are turning our back on all phenomena, including the phenomena that we now take to be ourselves, namely this body. Uh, his body consists composed of five sheaves. All these, we are turning our attention away from them back towards the fundamental awareness, I alone. So the more we attend to I alone, the more we recognize but ourself as nothing other than that. That is, what we actually are is not this person we seem to be when we look outwards. It is nothing but that fundamental awareness, I am. And that becomes more and more clear to us the more we look within. So when Bhagavan says, when we investigate keenly, what is it that now shines as I? As he says in the, um, in the first subsection of the first section of the Chara Sangram, he says, if one investigates keenly, what is it that now shines as I? Then, um, then without sound, a kind of sporana uh, will shine as I am I. What he means by a kind of sparana, in fact, he uses a Tamil term, spuripu, which is a, a Tamil form of the Sanskrit word, or a Tamil equivalent of the Sanskrit uh, term sparana. We will, we will, a clear, sparana means a clear shining. We'll be, we'll be clearly, a, that is, we'll be aware of ourself as, we'll, we'll, we'll experience a fresh clarity of self-awareness as not I am this or I am that, but I am I. So that is the significance of Bhagavan, of the term I am I, but Bhagavan used both while describing the practice and when describing the final goal. So I am I, the experience of our self as our self alone, the sparana, that is both our goal and they are both, both, our, both the goal and the means to reach the goal. In Vichara Sangraham, Bhagavan also talks about the sparana subsiding. What he means by the sparana subsiding is not that the clarity of self-awareness will, will subside, but when we first, during practice when we're experiencing the sparana, it seems to be something new and fresh. Because we've been, we have been so accustomed to experiencing ourselves as I am this body, I am this person. When we turn within and begin to experience ourselves as ourself alone, as I alone, it, it seems to be a, a new, fresh experience. But when we know ourselves as we actually are, when ego is finally eradicated by this parana, Bhagavan uses the analogy of, in the Charisang, he uses the analogy of a flame that catches camphor. When a flame catches a piece of camphor, 
if it's not, if it's allowed to burn without being extinguished, it will continue burning until the camphor is destroyed, and then it will subside. But it, that was the analogy Bhagavan used. But in the case of a sporana, what subsides is its newness. That is, so long as we are experiencing ourselves as ego, whatever degree of sporana we experience, whatever degree of clarity of self-awareness we experience, will seem to us to be something new. But when we experience that clarity in its fullness, and thereby ego is destroyed, we will find, oh, that's not anything new. That is what I'm, that is my eternal experience. So what seemed to be a new and fresh experience will be recognized to be sahaja, our natural experience. So th this is why Bhagavan is using this term, uh, I am I, to describe both the practice and the um, and the, the our final goal. So long as we are practicing, I am I seems to be something new and fresh, a, a fresh sporana, something shining forth. But we weren't. But we were. We were always. We were never not aware of ourselves as I am. But we were overlooking it because we were looking outwards, and thereby we were mistaking ourselves to be the body. The more we look within, the more the. the this mistaken notion, I am this body, will begin to lose its, 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 um, its solidity, its reality, and it will become more and more clear to us that what we actually are is I am I alone. Um, so this is what he's um, implied. In this third line, he implies it by saying nanadu. We, of course, nanadu literally means I am that. But we, if we if we are following carefully what Bhagavan is saying here, or if we are following Bhagavan's teachings carefully, or if we understand the, the real implication of the of the Mahavakyas in those ancient Mahavakyas from the Upanishads, they're all saying the same thing. But we ourselves are that. So what is that? Nothing but we. Nothing but I. So who am I? I, if I am that, that means I am I, because there's no that other than I. Uh, so this is all, this is where manana is so important. Manana means thinking deeply. So merely re we, can re we can spend lifetimes reading the Upanishads, reading the commentaries on them, studying these things. But unless we think really deeply, not just about the meaning of the words, but about the implication of the words. This is where manana, manana takes us from understanding the bare meaning of the words to understanding the inner implication of the words. So manana takes us from the, from the bachyata, the meaning of the words, to the lakshyata, the intended meaning. So the intended meaning of the Mahavakyas is that there is no such thing as that other than I. You are that. What is that? That is you. So, so who am I? If I am that, then that means, that means what? If that is I, then what am I? I am only I. That is where, that's where we have, to, we have to go beyond the surface meaning of the words to understand the inner implication. So Bhagavan is bringing, Bhagavan's teachings are bringing out the inner implication of all of Vedanta, the whole vast ocean of Vedanta literature, the, the implication, the practical implication of the whole of Vedanta is distilled in the few poems that Bhagavan has written, Aplapatu, Amabide, um, Upadeshundia, Uladu Napadu, Arunacha Stuti Panchakam, in these, and Nana, in these few, and some portions of Bichara Sangraham, in these few works, Bhagavan has distilled the whole essence of Vedanta. And he's distilled the essence and highlighted the practical implication of it. So what is the practical implication? If I am Brahman, then Brahman is nothing other than I. So who am I? I am nothing other than I, because I am Brahman and Brahman is nothing other than I. So the, the inner meaning of I am that is I am I. And that he, he emphasizes again, as I say, this is the third line. In the fourth line, he again emphasizes that. So um, before we come to the fourth line, I, just one other thing. Frying an apalam 
is a process of transforming. Uh, that is, when we when we prepare an apple, we prepare various ingredients, but all those ingredients are are in their in their uncooked form. They're tasteless and inevitable. But after carefully preparing those ingredients, in order to make them taste tasty and edible, we fry them. So frying of, uh, an apple is a process of transforming a tasteless and inedible wafer of carefully prepared and seasoned black gram dough into a tasty and nour nourishing apple Likewise, uh, the basic ingredients of this, uh, of this apple that Bhagavan is teaching us how to prepare in this song, basic ingredients is ego. The day have or false awareness, I am this body. This has to be carefully prepared and matured by the practice of self-investigation and self-surrender. And once it is uh, suitably prepared, it is then to be transformed into its underlying reality. What is the underlying reality of ego? Ego is the day happy mind of a false awareness. I am this body. What is the underlying reality of this? This body is unreal. What is real is only I am. So the, that fundamental awareness, I am, that is jnana. So that is what we have to transform. We are transforming ourselves into what we always actually are. In other words, we are shedding our adjuncts and remaining as we actually are. So this is what is meant by frying the apple. We are transforming ourselves into what we always actually are. And so we are to transform ourselves into pure awareness, which is itself the infinite space of silence, Mona, which is what is called Brahman and which shines eternally and solitarily in the heart as I am I. That is, I am that pure awareness that always shines only as I. So this is the implication of frying the aplomb. That is the final moment when having, having um, gone through all the struggle of practicing self-investigation and self-surrender in order to strengthen our sattvasana, the Bhagavan referred to in the in the second verse as the uh, in the second verse he described the satvasana. Satvasana means the inclination, a liking, a love to be as we actually are. He described it as the um, as the ula nalvasana, that is the uh, the good vasana in the heart. The good vasana in the heart means that satvasana. So all our practice of self-investigation and self-surrender is just uh, strengthening this satvasana and weakening all the contrary vasanas, namely the vishaya vasana, the inclination to go outwards and experience other things. The satvasana is the implication, the the inclination or love to turn within and just be as we actually are, all other vasanas are vishaya vasana. They are inclinations to experience things other than ourselves. So, in, so long as our vishaya vasanas are uh, strong, it seems to us to be difficult to turn within. Of course, it is never difficult to turn within. And there's nothing that is easier to attend to than I am, to than our own being because we're always aware of our own being. But it seems to be difficult because we are not willing to let go of other things. Our unwillingness to not to let go of other things is the Vishaya Vasanas, our inclination to hold on to the other things, whereas our love to turn within is the, the Sat Vasana. So we have to go through all the process of preparation to strengthen the sat vasana, the love to turn within, and to weaken the vishaya vasana as the inclination to turn outward. So that's what all the earlier stages are for. Once we have gained sufficient degree of sat vasana, we will thereby be, we, we thereby by turning within more and more deeply, we, tra we are transformed from what now seems to be an ego into what we always actually are, which is Brahman. If you, if you see a snake and mistake it, sorry, if you see a rope and mistake it to be a snake, the only way to get rid of that uh, snake 
is to look at it very carefully. If you look at the snake very carefully, you, it will be transformed into a, a rope. Of course, it's not actually transformed because it's always only a rope. But in our view, it seems to be transformed. What we were a moment before seeing as a snake, we suddenly realize, oh, it's only a rope. So there is a, there is a, a, not an actual transformation, but a transformation in our experience. What we were previously seeing as a rope, we are now seeing as a snake. What we were previously seeing as a snake, we are now seeing as a rope. Likewise, what we are now seeing as ego, at this false awareness, I am this body, this will be transformed, not actually transformed, but we, what we see as ego, we will see as pure awareness. So in that sense, it's a transformation. So just as the, the tasteless, uncooked apalam is transformed into a tasty and nourishing apalam, this, uh, this tasteless ego will be transformed into a very tasty uh, um, tanmaya apalam, as Bhagavan describes in the last, uh, 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 final line of this verse. Tanmaya apalam. Tanmaya means, tan, tanmaya means tat maya. Tat means that. Maya means uh, which is composed of or which is of the nature of that. So the, the apalam which is composed of that. In other words, that apalam is Brahman. So we are transforming ourselves into Brahman. And no, as it said in the Upanishad, the knower of Brahman becomes Brahman. It's not actually a process of becoming, it's that we are not transformed into Brahman. The knower of Brahman, that is, when we know ourselves as Brahman, we will know that we were always Brahman. But until we know ourselves as Brahman, we seem to be ego, we seem to be a jiva. So the, the jiva is to be transformed into Shiva. How is how can this little jiva be transformed into that great infinite shiva? But just by seeing what seeing itself as it actually is. So by looking within, we will see. But what we have previously taken to be jiva, this petty ego, is actually nothing but shiva, the one infinite whole. Um. So, uh, this this is what what Bhagavan implies here by the. But by the frying of the aplomb, it's that, that transformation in our, our, of our experience from a false experience, I am this body, to the true experience, I am I. So then finally, in the fourth line, he, I've already um, talked a little about, bit about the fourth line, but now I'll, I'll focus more on the fourth line. Finally, in the fourth line of this verse, he explains the nature of the apalam that we are thereby to cook, describing it as tanmaya apalam. That is the apalam that is of the nature of that. In other words, that means Brahman. So but what is the apalam? It's the infinite space of pure being, sat, pure awareness, chit, and pure happiness, ananda. It's avoid the, it's the sat, chit, ananda apalam. That's what is implied by tanmaya apalam. That, that aplam is nothing but what we always actually are, which is, as Bhagavan says in verse 28 of Upadesh Undia, if, if, one, if one knows the, what the real nature of oneself is, then anadi, ananta, akanda, satchid, ananda. Anadi means beginningless. Ananta means endless, limitless, infinite. Uh, Akanda means un, unbroken, undivided, indivisible. Um, sat chidananda. Uh, sat is, be, is being what, it, what actually exists. Chit is awareness, the pure awareness I am. And uh, ananda is the pure happiness, the infinite happiness that we actually are. So that is what we actually are. So that is that Tanmaya Apalam is nothing but the infinite ocean of Satchitananda, but we actually are. And how do we, what is the experience of eating this Apalam? He explains uh, beautifully. He says, uh, um, he says, um, Tane Tanaha uh, Bujika. Bujika. Is, is a verb that means to eat, consume, or feed on. 
And it also is used metaphorically to refer to experience or enjoying. So by experiencing ourself as tan e tan, oneself alone is oneself. In other words, I alone, am, myself alone is myself, or I alone am I. Um, th that experiencing ourselves is that that is eating this tanmaya uh, aplam. That is enjoying the, the sweet taste of Brahman by experiencing ourself as ourself alone. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so as I say, the, the last line is um, tane tana habujika tanmaya apalam uh, or oh, tanmaya apalamitu paru. Uh, uh, apalamitu paru is the, the palavi. Um, so the, the, the final line is tane tana ha uh, uh, bujika uh, uh, tanmaya apalam. Um, so uh, experiencing ourself as our self alone. Um, that is the, the consuming of, the, um, of the, uh, and experiencing the sweet taste of the apalam that we have prepared in the, the, as, as instructed by Bhagavan in this song. Um, so by, by, by saying in this final line, tane tana habujika, to experience or enjoy or consume, the tamaya apalam, as oneself alone is oneself, he implies that this is the purpose for which we are to make this tamaya apalam. The apalam composed of that, namely Satchitananda, in the manner described in the previous three verses. Um, and it's also the reason why we are to constantly fry it in the clear gear of Brahman, which is heated by the fire of pure awareness, jnana, in the uh, infinite silence of pure being, Mona, which is what inwardly reveals to us the real nature of ourself as I am just I. So for Bhagavan, I am I. Nan uh, uh, nane, um, uh, or tane uh, tan, or aham aham. That is both the path and the goal. That is what Bhagavan. Is, uh, is revealing to us through this song and in so many other places. That is, I am I, as I say, it means experiencing ourself as ourself alone. How can we experience ourself as ourself alone? Only by looking within more and more and more, by, um, by, by the, uh, what he describes in the first verse of this song as nana enna uh, jnana vichara, this, this this, uh, this awareness investigation, who am I? That is, by investigating ourselves as who am I, we begin to experience ourselves as I am I. And the deeper we go within, the more clearly we will experience ourselves as I am I. And eventually, when that experience I am I becomes perfectly clear, it will destroy the false awareness I am this body, and our, what will remain is only our self shining as our self alone. I alone am I. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arunachala Ramanaya.